Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenyo La Shubawale. The United Nations climate talks are heading towards a rocky conclusion after two weeks of tense debate failed to resolve several key disputes. Pressure is mounting as negotiators from nearly 200 countries try to strike a deal on tackling climate change. A new draft agreement released today waters down language on phasing out coal and fossil fuels but strengthens calls for nations to toughen climate targets. Approaching the final day of the two-week COP26 UN Climate Summit, a new draft document from the United Nations Climate Summit has been published with a weakening of language around the phasing out of fossil fuels. The new draft includes two words on fossil fuels that dilute an earlier draft, which had boldly stated that the world should pledge to stop subsidies for fossil fuels in general and phase them out. Arab nations, many of which are big producers of oil and gas, had objected to the fossil fuel wording in the earlier draft. COP26 President Alok Sharma has called on nations to do more to get an agreement, saying countries need to show a can-do spirit. They do bring us another step closer towards the comprehensive, ambitious and balanced set of outcomes which I hope parties will adopt by consensus at the close of play today. We have made a lot of progress. Across the full suite of the draft decisions, a small number of key issues remain which require our urgent collective attention. We have come a long way over the past two weeks and now we need that final injection of that can-do spirit which is present at this COP so that we get this shared endeavour over the line. The people united will never be defeated. Climate groups have cautiously welcomed signs of progress in the draft but say there is a long way to go yet. How can you all come to Glasgow, say you're working to keep 1.5 degrees in sight and not have an outcome that is ambitious and, and equitable? I think the key things are building the, the acceleration mechanism. We know that the world's not on enough uh, action right now so that leaders come back every year until we're in a stable situation and can avoid the worst impacts and getting a pact, a solidarity support for the poorest nations on earth that are suffering from COVID, suffering from debt, that they get the type of finance that they need, the type of support to adapt to the impacts and the type of support to deal with the the impacts that are already happening, their losses and damages. Those are the key things that we're looking for. Those are the key things that I think need to be there in order to get out of this building. Youth climate activists at the summit also seemed unimpressed. There's not much time left to take serious action to save save humanity essentially from a rising global temperatures and the people in that conference need to do something significant and we're here today to be in the crowd to make a voice to get, hopefully get them to listen. With the summit scheduled to end on Friday, negotiators have been working around the clock to try to clinch a deal that almost 200 countries can agree to, although many delegates expect the conference to spill into the weekend. We are in roughly the same position. My fellow global. The COP26 conference has so far not delivered enough emissions, cutting pledges to nail down the 1.5 degrees centigrade goal, so the draft asked countries to upgrade their climate targets in 2022. Meanwhile, the United States pre uh, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, appears confident that the negotiations are moving in the right direction. In the internal parlance of these crazy meetings that we have, uh, those things can make a difference to people. Which the important is thing is, uh, I'm not going to say it because I don't know. I want to see what context it's in. But uh, I think the language is coming together. I really feel very confident we are going to raise the amount of money for adaptation. We're going to be moving in the right direction. Less developed countries desperately need additional help. We agree with that. From day one at this COP, we've been saying the United States wants to raise the amount for adaptation. We support it, and we'll be moving in the right direction, I believe, as we leave here. 
but not so optimistic. Representatives of civil society groups have voiced their frustration with the United Nations COP26 climate summit. Attendees say they wanted a more ambitious outcome from the conference than the draft decisions that have been released so far. Governments in the UNFCCC have repeatedly failed to deliver meaningful and just outcomes. We have come together here today as United Nations constituencies representing global civil society to express our deep frustration with this most exclusionary of COPs and the continued shirking of responsibility by those who have caused the climate crisis. That means as we approach the end of this, the 26th annual conference of the party to the UNFCCC, we are hurtling ever closer to breaching the critical 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. It is essential, it is essential that the voice of the many uh, is heard to the few who are taking decisions. And that's very important since we want a strong uh, cover decision at the end of, of, uh, of COP26. We want to raise ambition, we want them to do real work about that and that is why we are here. Our correspondent Ayola Kasim has been following the negotiations in Glasgow from where she joins us. Ayola, it's crunch time for negotiators. What's the mood like in the negotiating room? Well, we just um, had a plenary. Um, so plenary has just ended now about like 15 minutes ago, uh, where different countries stated what the, their opinion, what they see uh, is wrong or what they feel is right about uh, about the text so we have um, different countries praising it and you have Russia saying talking about the market and non-market mechanism that's where um, developing countries are, are actually not happy saying that you can double count your your carbon emission so they want to declare uh, wordings on that it's more about language some are praising the language the strong language some are no some are knocking the weak languages. So this is the point where we are should and shall um, insufficient, sufficient. You know the language that you use, urging, recognizes all those ones. People are now picking, fine picking, no, 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 picking each line, each statement, each words being used. That's the state we are now. And then uh, we've just been told that any moment, like later today, we've not given exact. We, we've not been giving exact time that the, 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 plenary, the plenary will resume and then people are urged to, to consult with their delegates and their ministers and their government uh, such that when we come back later today we have a, a, a fine text like a clean version of the text that's that's the moment we are at the moment uh, realistically though at this point how soon are they likely to agree on a deal um, there's been talks that the summit could run into the weekend yes it looks the same but maybe early tomorrow morning <laughs> so but then it's about the text it's about the it's about the language being used okay like article 6 they're saying that um it is crucial that anyone as it says, like we define how people are protected, how the baseline is being protected, and the protection of human rights and people's rights of the indigenous people. We are, we are now looking at like how the Paris Agreement is going to work. They're fine tuning the language. So some are saying that some aspect the language is strong. They're saying that as other aspects, like loss and damage, for instance, that the language is not strong enough, and they finance for developing countries that are that that. Are, experiencing the impact of climate change already that the loss and damage is like um, insurance benefit so to speak like you've um, you've experienced some losses you've experienced some damages so this is something to compensate you for your losses so that's what they're saying that there's no enough finance for that so and an argue, and a conversation is going on like back and forth on that they want strong language on that and then there's something called the carbon market mechanism such that saying that okay organizations can account for their um their, 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 when we talk about next zero that you sell your carbon emission it can sell their carbon emission but at the same time countries can also say that this is our carbon emission so that it gives room for double counting so they want the language to be clear 
on that as well. So that is the, it's about language now, about fine tuning what goes into the role book, what goes into financing and how the finance can be mobilized. That's the state of things. As we approach the end of the summit and wait for the deal to be announced, you know, despite pledges made, uh, current pledges put the world significantly off track and headed for warming well above two degrees Celsius. So just explain to us what exactly has been achieved in the summit. Well, at the start of the summit, it was around 2.7 now it's about two one point nine that that i mean from people are readjust countries are, are readjusting their national determined contribution that's like this is their pledge this is what i'm gonna do to reduce my emissions so from what it's, it's sort of reduced because every day people are adjusting their ndcs countries are adjusting their ndcs organizations are contributing so in you you can't really say that it, we Glasgow can hasn't really achieved, but hasn't achieved more. Some we say is the flow, not the selling. So it's better, like I said, we are making a movement, but just like it's not ambitious enough. So people are saying we can still do more on about on what we what we are proposing, on what countries are proposing. More can still be done. It's not good enough. That's the level that we are now. It's better than where we were at the start of last week where we are now is a lot better than that but we can still do a lot more and scotland for instance is leading the way it's pledging it's um, is sort of lobbying sort of speaking to colleagues and saying we can do better than what we currently have and the eu surprisingly today um they've been quiet and then in the last plenary that we just saw this afternoon coming out and saying we need to do more to help the future generation so in some ways we're seeing some bright light but are we going to get 1.5 within the next few hours that we have we don't know just keeping fingers crossed really <laughs> Ayla, well we'll have to wait and see thank you so much for the update thank you Away from the COP26 summit, Western members of the UN Security Council have condemned Belarus for the escalating crisis over migrants stranded on its border with Poland. In a strongly worded statement, they accused Belarus of using the migrants to destabilize the EU's eastern border. Russia, Belarus's main ally, has rejected the accusations. Meanwhile, the US Vice President Kamala Harris says she's very concerned about the situation at the border. Uh, on the issue of, of Belarus and what is happening at the border with Poland, we are very concerned about that and closely paying attention to it. And um, the Lukashenko regime, I believe, um, is um, engaged in very troubling activity. It is something that I discussed with President Macron and the eyes of the world and its leaders are watching what is happening there. We have a mutual concern there that relates to the ongoing challenges that the countries in the Sahel are facing. Among the many priorities that we share is a concern about what we need to do to address potential violence and ongoing violence. And to that end, we renewed, if there was any doubt, which there was not, our mutual commitment to work to each other, with each other on counterterrorism. Still on the Belarus-Poland uh, border crisis, Medicine Sans Frontières humanitarian advisor Kyle McNally says the humanitarian situation at the border with Poland and Belarus will worsen if humanitarian access is not granted to the migrants. He urges the EU authorities to stop the hybrid war rhetoric and make way for humanitarian aid. The situation at the border is desperate and it's getting worse by the day. You have thousands of people who are effectively stuck between European and Belarusian border guards, trapped in a cold, damp, dark forest, and desperately in need of assistance. The longer people stay there, the more that the situation will deteriorate. There needs to be unfettered, unconditional humanitarian access granted to these people. MSF is calling on European authorities to allow for humanitarian organizations such as MSF to reach these people so that way we can understand their needs and respond accordingly. 
In the meantime, European Commission Vice President Margarita Shinas has welcomed a move by Turkish aviation authorities to limit air traffic to Belarus. The EU accuses the country of creating the crisis as part of a hybrid attack on the bloc following its imposition of sanctions on Minsk over human rights abuses. Change is happening. I was in Dubai yesterday where I was impressed by the commitment of the authorities of the UAE to work with us to uh, put an end to these practices. I would like to salute publicly the decision by the Turkish Civil Aviation Authority that has announced a couple of hours ago their decision to also limit uh, this type of operations and I got uh, assurances from my interlocutors here in Lebanon that Lebanon is also ready to work with us in that respect. Before I left uh, Brussels uh, Wednesday, uh, we had, uh, together with my colleague, Commissioner for Transport, Adina Valian, we had a teleconference with the Association of Arab Airlines, who are meeting in Qatar, and we had the opportunity in very clear terms to explain the situation and ask for their help and commitment. Uh, I think our message was understood loud and clear, and we are encouraged to see that uh, mm, there is response uh, to this message, as I was saying earlier. Away from Europe, an explosion has hit a mosque in the Spinga area of Nangaha province in eastern Afghanistan during Friday prayers, uh, killing at least three people and injuring 15 others. According to reports, the blast occurred around 1.30 p.m. local time when explosives, which were apparently located inside the mosque, detonated. A Taliban official has confirmed the blast. There was no immediate claim of responsibility for the attack. The latest in a series of blasts to hit mosques in Afghanistan over recent weeks, undermining the Taliban's claim to have restored security after decades of war. The mosque was attended by Sunni Muslims. Previous attacks since the Taliban takeover have struck Shiite mosques and have been claimed by the Sunni militant group Islamic State. Some updates from the COVID-19 pandemic now. Russia reports 1,235 deaths from COVID-19 in the past 24 hours, plus the Netherlands set for partial lockdown as infections surge. Here's the global update. Russia has reported 1,235 coronavirus-related deaths in the last 24 hours, close to a record one-day toll recorded earlier this week amid a nationwide surge in cases. According to the official data, a total of 252,926 people died of coronavirus in Russia during the pandemic. The country has been experiencing a sharp increase in the number of daily infections from mid-September to the end of October. Since the beginning of November, new daily infection cases stopped around 40,000. Bars and restaurants in the Netherlands will close early and sporting events will be held without spectators under a three-week partial lockdown expected to be announced. The measures are meant to contain a rapid surge in COVID-19 cases that is straining hospitals across the country. New infections topped 16,000 for the second day in a row on Friday, beating the previous record of just under 13,000 confirmed cases in a day set in December last year. Dutch broadcaster Nas said the first lockdown measures in Western Europe since the summer will go into effect on Saturday evening. German Health Minister Jens Spahn has announced that Austria will be classified as a COVID-19 high-risk area starting Sunday. The classification means that people traveling from Austria must enter quarantine upon arrival in Germany unless they have been vaccinated or have recovered from COVID-19. 
Germany's fourth COVID-19 wave is already stretching capacity in some hospitals, prompting doctors to say they will have to postpone scheduled surgeries and several states to tighten hygiene regulations. And finally, two foreign athletes have tested positive for COVID-19 during test events for the Beijing 2022 Winter Games. Both are luggers of the same nationality and have been transferred to quarantine hotels. And finally on the program, Nigerian teenager Joseph Adedeji has been named winner of an award by the Hack for Earth Foundation. The 15-year-old art student whose dream for a better future won the Dream for Earth Award has been hosted at the Nigeria Pavilion located at the Expo 2020 site in Dubai. Our correspondent, Maiwa Adigoke, reports. 15-year-old Nigerian Joseph Adedeji takes a shine at the Nigeria Pavilion. On what should have been the country's National Day celebration at the Expo 2020, his imagination has attracted the world's attention, and this makes up for the postponed event. Hi, my name is Joseph Adedeji, and my dream is to wake up and see a world with economic and political stability. Adedeji's dream video won the Hack for Earth Foundation's Dream for Earth Award, and that won him a trip to the expo. I, I saw the I saw the advert on Facebook. I had I have a setting on Facebook that that brings anything that I have to do with United Nations or competitions challenge to to my to me. So I saw this I saw this competition on Facebook. Then I went to I went to use an app. I also saw the advert in an in ad app. I went to, I went to a game. So I also saw the advert, same advert. I went to YouTube. I saw the same advert. So I decided to check it because. Um, in the description, I saw something that have to do with share your dream for the, with the, with the UN SDG goals. So, and, I, and I love the SDG goals, so I decided to, to read more. Then I got interested in the competition and I, I decided to prepare. So I started writing, I, I started preparing like a write up for the video. This dream got more than 7,000 likes. Uh, and we had dreams, 1,200 dreams from 61 countries. I mean, youth are the future. And uh, it's the youth that are going to inherit the planet after the older generations. So we need to focus absolutely on the youth and to teach them about to take care of the planet, teach them about how to fight poverty, teach them about how to be more healthy and so on and so forth. Hack for Earth's ongoing hackathon is domiciled at the Swiss Pavilion and aims to promote citizen-driven innovation that creates real solutions for the future. We took all the dreams and we created uh, challenges upon them. So this is basically taking the dreams of people of the world and making them come true for our future. So right now, actually, uh, there are more than 120 countries, teams from more than 120 countries participating in this global online hackathon. And uh, uh, actually, uh, the most participants are joining from Nigeria. So uh, more than, uh, I think, 45 teams are joining from Nigeria uh, among the uh, 120 countries. So that's really an amazing achievement. A lot of people in Nigeria are very passionate about creating change for our future. The art student who hopes to someday become a diplomat has several tech skills and also has a team participating in the competition. Our, our solution name is, is called MIMU. We are trying to build a virtual pharmacy which we like diagnose you. you know, every, everything that a pharmacy will do to you, this app will be able to do it. Already there are a lot of people from Nigeria that have applied for this and have made submissions. So we're looking forward to hosting more Nigerians and more Nigerian winners at the Nigerian Pavilion. Adedeji's fate at the Nigerian Pavilion is expected to set off a series of other events in the coming days. I'm just so excited and proud that it was a Nigerian that won out of all the countries. So that's great. Well, safe to say that National Day became Joseph's Day at the Nigerian Pavilion at the Expo 2020 site. The official National Day will now be December the 3rd. From the Nigerian Pavilion at the Dubai 2020 Expo site, Maya Wadigoke for Channel's Television News. Amazing stuff. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenny Olashavoale. Have a lovely weekend.